Well, we're already in the middle of the topic. Uh, again, innovation, I can no longer. How did we come up with this title? Nina wrote me whether I would like to speak about innovation. And I pondered on the uh, problems associated with innovation. What I observe time and again is that there is a certain innovation fatigue. I know this from our company as well, from me as well. And I tried, and this is just some inspiration to come up with some recipes against this innovation fatigue. And my aim is also to um, not always reach agreement here in the room. And this is why I will only speak for 30 minutes. And if you have any objections or additional ideas, let's talk about them. The funny thing about innovations is that when innovations are complete, they're cool, they're hip. So when they're complete, then they're usually practical, handy. Let's think of old uh, innovations innovations from the communication sector, the biro going back to 1938 or a little later, the mobile phone. A little later, yet again, the internet. It is older than I am, actually. Then emojis. They are just uh, the same age. <laughs> and, of course, um, AI. Um, there's no way avoiding it. But back in 2012, the first AI um, recognized an image. So this technology is older than you might think. And nevertheless, when you were here, or uh, as you are here today at the print days, uh, you will have realized that AI it cannot be denied any longer. So innovations everywhere, also in publishing and communication. And innovation is not only hip because it's new, because um, it is also hip because it keeps companies alive. Innovations are what make us, uh, companies survive. I've brought three examples. You probably know Kodak. This used to be a photo film camera. You probably remember these little film rolls. Kodak was actually the first company that invented a digital camera. So a huge, a giant innovation. Unfortunately, Kodak was also the company that said, uh, no, we're making enough sales with these films and this is why we're not investing so much in digital cameras. So let's go fast forward. Kodak no longer exists in this format. Another example is the Palm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm bringing back memories here. Yes, exactly. It was a tool that everybody loved. Unfortunately, the Palm didn't recognize or realize that you could have also made telephones with it. Then they would have invented the smartphone for the young ones among us. Uh, the Palm is like uh, um, a, an address book, a notepad. You could draw, yes, for notes, for emails. So it was a smartphone without a phone. Yes, games were also in included. Everything excluding the phone. So Palm actually invented something that the world was waiting for, but then did not think any further. The Palm no longer exists. It was uh, bought up by HP, and then sooner or later it was uh, discontinued, the production. It sounds uh, sad, but there were also cooler examples. Yeah, BlackBerry, right. Yeah, that's exciting. That's good to know. Yeah, they turned into BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. it, it would become a BlackBerry it, had they had keys. Play-Doh is another example. You will probably rem remember Plasticine. Um, you can actually form it. Uh, but the exciting thing is that Play-Doh was actually a detergent. It's age-old. Play-Doh already existed when we had wood heating and wallpapered walls. And this was a tool to clean my wall and remove any carbon residues from the wallpaper. Then gas heating arrived, disruptive invasion. And all of a sudden, they came under pressure because nobody had to clean the walls because gas ne leaves no carbon residues. What happened? Well, the Play-Doh owned talked to a teacher in his hometown and she said well your wall cleaners are great but uh, we're not using them as wall cleaners please don't discontinue them because I use them for gaming with my students so he actually put his uh, company upside down to produce a plasticizer and now it's the biggest plasticizer manufacturer in the world so innovations are what uh, makes companies survive and now the big question arises how do companies stay innovative? How do they become innovative? I've tried today to actually list five uh, 
buzzwords starting with an F. This is not the secret recipe for success, but it is setting screws. Certain elements where you might think, well, how do we fare as a company? How do I fare as a person, personally, when it comes to these elements? The first one is very obvious. Fire. We need passion. So passion is step one for innovation. And I don't think we don't have to dwell on this for too long. It takes fire for every department. It is not enough uh, to actually establish an innovation department and then to actually source out the fire. No, the fire must be felt inside the company. You see time and again, when you look at innovative processes in companies, you feel immediately that the professionals also have to think innovatively because the innovation department often lacks the technical know-how to understand how to change a product possibly to make it new or better. So this is my take on it. We can discuss it, but I think innovation departments are not good. Another point, um, th this is such a huge, huge expectation. If you say there are people who do nothing but innovate every day, I know nobody who could do that. And I know so many people. This is so um, uh, intense. So how do we inject innovation into the teams? Uh, innovation cannot be sourced out and you cannot be bought in either through a coach or consultant. You have to be innovative yourself. And only once you've understood this, you've created a basis for innovation. This is my thesis. Yes, yeah, a catalyst. Yes, of course. Yes, you can bring in people, but you can't get delegate innovation. One principle that uh, is very widespread uh, in Silicon Valley is act like an owner. Behave as if this company was yours. And this is a principle that uh, is uh, uh, featured in LinkedIn, in startups, in Silicon Valley. This is widespread there. Behave as if this company was your company. At Montag, this is easy. We have, we're four people. Uh, we cut it up. Uh, into four pieces and a quarter. Well, I own a quarter at Google. Um, through shares, you can become a shareholder as soon as you're employed. So they handle it differently. And you can coin the culture um, that uh, makes everybody behave like an owner. Let's remember Play-Doh Play or Palm. If I lead a company, if I own a company, and there are many self-employed people here in the room, they know this feeling. I constantly think on how to position my company that it survives um, when somebody something new arrives so that people feel responsible for the company. Another buzzword uh, is uh, the culture fit over skills fit. So these are just inspirations I'm providing you with. This culture fit over skills fit is a concept that means that I look for new people based on the befitting character and culture rather than on fitting skills. For instance, he can code PAP, he can actually do JavaScript. You can learn all of this, what you can not earn that easily or learn that easily is to learn something new quickly to actually be part of a team very quickly and um, uh, it is difficult to find somebody to find uh, uh, somebody who to write Rava scripts. But uh, at Morntag, we always work this way. Our latest uh, employee is a guitar player um, by profession, and he is now a coder. And he learns twice as much as I do every week, but he's incredibly innovative because he's passionate for it. And this is a central point when you think of innovation. You can also think about uh, um, who could be a cultural owners. You shouldn't say, well, this is uh, innovative guys, we'll put them into the innovation department. No, we look for the cultural fit first and then we actually allow them to coin and do dominate our culture. You probably have high performers in certain technical departments, you have high performers in leading departments or in sales and very often they're also the cultural high performers and they're 
of central importance because they're so key uh, for these innovation processes. This is the people you like to have coffee with, you um, love to listen to when they have new ideas. Um, they're people who love to try out something new, who have a positive attitude. So give it some thought. Who are the people in my team who could do that and tell them so? It uh, simply tell them, well, I think it's cool how you always try out, try out new things at uh, our company. And I think it's it, how motivated you're always. And leave those people in their teams and allow them to actually coin your corporate culture. What it also takes is freshness because innovation is incredibly painstaking. Maybe you're working in a startup, then you will know from your everyday work. Uh, it's nerve wracking at times. Um, you know, uh, you need something new, but how to and uh, uh, what does it have to do in version one? We have to change our business model. This is really nerve wracking and we must be aware of this. You cannot actually push innovation to the last hour of the day and say and then we'll do a little bit of information when we're tired people human beings can do that can't do that and I think that this is very important that we're aware of this. And it is also important that we keep ourselves fresh. Uh, holistic health, this is a classic, we need to be fit, sleep enough, I don't have to tell you. And nevertheless, it is important that the corporate culture builds on this. We at Morantag make sure that this happens. When I feel that my colleague is uh, tired, she doesn't want to, I tell her, come on, why don't you go home at 3 p.m.? And this is exactly uh, what builds confidence because we take care of each other. I think this is of central importance if you want to be innovative because it, this can be so hard. Then uh, psychological or mental uh, safety. Psychological safety means that I feel safe to question matters and come up with new ideas. Uh, mental safety is not actually laughing at somebody, blaspheme, uh, constantly question people. And because this actually makes me abstain from stating new ideas. There's an exciting Google study available. If you want to see it, I can give you the link. They studied at what makes teams successful in the teams were very diverse, male, female, older, younger, well-skilled, less well-skilled, educated, uh, um, um, and uh, spread, non-spread. Um, all of these elements were compared that could impact teamwork. And it was exciting to see that these elements had no impact. The mental safety counted. That was the biggest factor. So if I feel safe to uh, swim against the current with new ideas, then this is one of the most important points for a team. It, it's uh, not, uh, it's a really um, a study worthwhile reading, a Google study. Also important is freedom. And it's not about being free from rules or guidelines. Uh, let's do what we want to. No, this doesn't work. At least in uh, big companies, this doesn't work because you need frameworks. But you need to be free of certain concepts. Um, I actually took this uh, frame because free freedom has to do with what I expect from others and what others expect from me very often. You, when you came to this uh, conference, had a frame and you will have thought, well, Horst, whoever knows Horst, will do something funny to, to kick it off. Then the talks uh, will be competent, they will be expert talks, the people will be speaking German, it will be about print and about e-commerce. So you came with a certain frame and frames, according to researchers, are very emotional. So when I expect something and it does not materialize, then this is an emotional thing. This is not a technical uh, issue. So we have to remember this. So when somebody brings an idea that I haven't expected, and regardless of whether it's good or bad, if my uh, frame is broken or disrupted, then this is emotional. And we should never forget about this. 
So if you're interested, contact me. I can send you the statistics. What's exciting to note here is that this has a lot to do with uh, feelings. Uh, so what does it do to me when somebody actually tables a new idea, especially as an executive, as a leader, we have to be aware of this. I am the product manager at Montag and our company, and I frame continuously. And then a coder comes, my husband, and says, huh, but I do it differently, and it's a lot better that way. My uh, frame has been broken, and this is nerve-wracking. And it helps to be aware, okay, my brain thinks uh, it's emotional, maybe it's not that emotional and then you can restore this mental this psychological safety uh, it feels like uh, he was against me but actually it was only against my framing yeah poor Yoshi somebody said I think that this is important that you let your uh, co-workers know I allow you to disrupt my framing to get on my nerves with your ideas because this is what I want you to do because this is what innovation is all about but um Maybe also freedom from fixed uh, flows and concept stages. Well, I have made, uh, found a very exciting experiment, the marshmallow experiment. Not the experiment where you try to get as many marshmallows in your mouth as possible. No, the experiment looks as follows. So there are teams and each team gets 20 spaghetti, one meter of string, adhesive tape, duct tape and uh, uh, one marshmallow. Mellow. And they're given 18 minutes to build a structure on which the marshmallow sits. A difficult task. It takes creativity and innovation. This is, these are the results of how various uh, target groups uh, responded to this experiment. It was about the height they achieved to the extreme left. We've got the business uh, administration students. Then next are the attorneys. Then uh, kindergarten kids. Yeah, kin kindergarten kids. Yeah. Yeah, not the educators. No, 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 no. It's the kids. It's children attending a kindergarten. It's kids. It's really children. No, 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 no. In the statistics, this is the kids, not the educators. That's an important difference. <laughs> and then architects, engineers, then CEOs and CEOs and executives to the extreme right. But height was not part of the task. How do you measure it? Was it measured over time? No, you're given 18 minutes to build as high as possible. Yeah, exactly. The average was 55 centimeters and the kindergarten kids are better than the average. And the business administration students fared worst uh, of all of the uh, um, test persons. They only achieved roughly above uh, 10 inches. This is roughly 25 centimeters. So what was the difference? The kindergarten kids try out five different structures, whereas the business school students only tried one, sketch it out, try it out, and if it fails, then they, they're left with nothing. So they are higher peaks towards zero, and this also means they are faring worse. So what we see and learn from this experiment is that experiments are more effective than business plans. And I'll leave it at that as a statement. What we also see is that the kindergarten kids were prepared to make mistakes. Because failure is buzzword number four. Failures and um, errors are disliked in the Dach region. And I think this is one of the main problem for innovation. Fail fast is a principle pursued in Silicon Valley for a simple reason. When it takes too long to realize that you failed, then it becomes too expensive. So we have to fail fast because uh, failing slowly is simply too expensive. And this is why we have to learn to accept mistakes. The whole thing is very exciting 
when you give it a thought. When you fail several times, you can reorient yourself several times. This is uh, a scientific graph, but easy to understand. I try to make the lines equally long. So uh, we did the same amount of work, but uh, we only tried once and failed, or we tried several times and failed again and again until we reached the aim. In practice, such projects uh, are more planable than those on the other curve. And this brings us to agility. I don't know who attended uh, Horst's uh, presentation on agility. We have to be aware that we should better fail several times rather than actually trying for too long and losing a lot of money and then fucking up. How can you promote failure? That's difficult. On the one hand, it's about the psychological safety again. I know I can make mistakes and that's okay. This failure culture should be aware amongst people. There are even companies who get a card. When you're newly employed, you get a I fucked up card. And this card um, is placed on your desk. And while you work, you try out things. And sooner or later, um, you really fuck up. Yeah, you, you really mess up. And then you can actually hand in the card with your line manager. Who, whoever after a year or two has not uh, f uh, submitted this card uh, has to leave, is terminated. It's a tough concept. Um, so strong failure is demanded. But I think it's also very cool because it no longer demonizes failure so much. Yes. So once you've not handed in the the card after you, you fucked up. Yeah. It's a healthy uh, uh, failure culture. I think if we're not never prepared to fail, then we're never prepared to try out anything. We'd rather do nothing. And this is so dangerous. In the Silicon Valley, it's exciting when you're looking for investors. I actually talked to a startup uh, founder. It's really exciting. When you're looking for investors, they're being asked, how, well, how? How many companies have you ruined? And if you say none, then you will not get it that investor because the problem is that this pro persons don't know when to stop. These guys don't know. Now we've lost too much money. Now we have to start from scratch again. And this is really important to know. So errors are perfectly normal. We all started running. We all fell and then learned maybe we should actually stand a bit more, a bit more wide legged. But you learn from mistakes and this is how companies also work, making mistakes. Maybe let's get back to this chart. Maybe uh, when you, uh, maybe it makes sense to not ask for the whole waterfall planning for a new project. Maybe it's better to say, well, try it for four hours and then let's uh, get back and talk about it. This is what we always do. When somebody comes with a new idea, then we discuss it. How much money or how much time will we invest? And in the worst case, it's gone, it's lost. And then we use this time. And if we don't get a proper result in this time, a learning curve, we fail and realize this is this was wrong. If we simply try out for four hours and then realize that nobody wants it and it's stupid, then we uh, actually leave it. And we've only lost four hours. If we asked our uh, coder to first come up with the concept, then submit the uh, concept, then write a budget, then uh, present a budget um, plan or business plan, it's simply too expensive. So we have to dare being innovative before we put a price tag on it. This is difficult, but it is important, I think. Yes, these were my four bullet points. So make sure whether you're passionate, whether you're fire, passionate people. Am I fresh enough? Do we have enough freshness? Um, am I prepared to accept failure and mistakes? And let's discuss about it. Yeah, any remarks? Uh, do you also do this in your private life? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, how often has your marriage failed? No. 
<laughs> no, no. Yeah, I accept um, uh, mistakes. I think this is also important in private terms. To, to allow your partner to fail or make mistakes is centrally important, especially with my blog. Uh, I'm a public person, and this is uh, why you have to accept failure at times. Um, that's okay. The story about the innovation department, I think that this is a key point you made because uh, you actually pe uh, bring people out of context. Innovation has to actually be born out of your daily business and very often there is not the, the, the virtual room available unless you're annoyed at something for the 20th time. But this is an exciting field. When I take people out and put them into an innovation department, then they lose contact to daily business somehow and the idea at our end is uh, the prevailing one to say well this is run by the team unless uh, uh, you're not working in a 20 guy company in, in a company where you have a hierarchy um, an idea for the business plan if you want to build a prototype and I have to have an authority to do that and we arrived at the conclusion that uh, the, it must be a head of story. So uh, where you have a hierarchy with the um, head of the department, but is part of the team. What is your experience in bigger companies um, employing more than the 70 or 80 uh, staff? Well, I worked at a print shop where we had over 100 uh, staff and there was a web department. This is not an innovation department per se, but the web department worked differently. And I think we can compare the two. Sooner or later, they simply they couldn't com communicate any longer because uh, they did a stand-up meeting, uh, had coffee at nine, and the um, uh, uh, subscription department said, they're taking a break, they're taking a break. and they could no longer communicate and this is why they were taken out the whole department which was a shame was it for failure or was it a success you have the guy you have to ask the guys who's still working there i left when they took this step for the culture of the print shop it was uh, more of a disadvantage but it was probably also healthy to say we, we won't reconcile them. Uh, with, failure, with failure and the error culture is important, but successes are just as important. And uh, the dialectics between a failure and success, just think of a football team when they've lost eight times in a row, then it is very hard to actually keep the team motivated for a, for a coach. But what also happens in football, when you've won 6-0, to zero, then a good coach nevertheless watches the videos and looks whether there's room for improvement. Because often the devil is in the detail, as we know. Although I have scored a huge success, I need to take a very detailed look at the details that I can still improve um, because I failed there. Uh, and for the next match, I can improve. If there's no success, then you, then, then you won't get anywhere. That's true. Um, it really depends on which type of uh, innovation we're talking about. We have a lot to do with code innovations. Um, I will be speaking in the print session this afternoon and the question is always, will we manage or not? And it's even a success to know this is not the right way. We're working with diagrams and PDFs of, uh, via print access and this is difficult because we don't quite check which is the best uh, solution between the user experience for the back end and release and efficiency on the front end and this needs to be found out and if a coder invests for hours and then fails because he realizes uh, well this solution we've tested doesn't work then the question is really is this a failure at times that the term is difficult because errors or failures uh, don't equate uh, learning but at times it is <laughs> um, it does yeah it, there's a difference. We only learn from mistakes, so we don't learn from successes. 
maybe as well what we do not learn if we only want to be successful only those who don't work don't make any mistakes there is this uh, saying i'm just busy uh, acquiring a very uh, good experience with a mixture of here and there I am the point uh, that actually includes innovation as a staff department, but I also have contact persons in all of the other teams, the so-called innovation scouts, who are involved in the daily production but as a half position or of, um, depending on the potential who talk to me, talk to the others and exchange with them. Oh, cool. And this works very well. I am actually out of the production itself and no longer suffer the stress with customers and the others 50% uh, of the time. I would find it very difficult to, to enter production and um, the best of both worlds, um, uh, full time, uh, that's difficult. Well, we call it differently, but you, you could actually refer to it. It is a staff staff position. Internal process optimization is the name for it. Well, that's exciting. Cool. Maybe that's a good uh, solution for big companies. In which industry? Print publishing as well. Yeah, SME. We're between 100 and 120 employees. Cool. That's exciting. Well, any other thoughts? Yeah, cool. Caught you all. Well then, I don't want to force anyone to be sitting here. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening. And if you want to carry on discussing, I'll stay around until we need to leave the room. And Carolina will tell us when to leave the room. Well, thank you very much for attending. And I hope that you can actually stay fresh, make mistakes uh, and uh, yeah. learn from it. Thank you. Thank you.